The book of Numbers is the fourth book of the Bible, fourth book of the Old Testament, part of the Pentateuch or the Torah in Jewish tradition, uh, attributed in the way of these things to Moses, which doesn't necessarily mean that Moses is the author of it in the way that we understand authorship today, but it's a way in the sense of showing this very important narrative, a very important book that goes back deep into the heart of Jewish self-understanding. In fact, the Jewish title for the book is drawn from one of the opening Hebrew words in the text, which is in the wilderness. I like that title better. It's a much more engaging title and it reflects the, uh, the focus of the narrative in the book. Uh, the English title, Numbers, which comes from the Greek and Latin titles for the book, comes from the fact that the book opens with a census in which the Israelites are counted. And so there are a lot of numbers in the opening chapter of the book. And in fact, more than once in the book, you get lists of people being counted. So numbers is not an inaccurate reflection of one aspect of the book, but it's perhaps helpful to think of it as a book with a much more engaging title, In the Wilderness. What is the book about? Well, in one sense, it's part of the longer Pentateuchal narrative. Uh, if we recall the book of Genesis, laying the foundations of Israel's story, telling the story of the great uh, men and women of God who, who lie at the very beginning of the tale, Abraham and Sarah, and then on through Isaac and Jacob and uh, Rachel, Rebecca. And then with the arrival of Moses and the book of Exodus, we come to the famous story of the Israelites in slavery in Egypt and then being led out in the Exodus across the sea and into their own land, except that they don't arrive immediately at their own land. They are required to walk there, make their way there. Uh, they camp momentarily, it seems, at Mount Sinai. They're given the law, and we then read through the last part of the book of Exodus and the whole of the book of Leviticus of some of the laws that God is giving them. And the book of Numbers takes up what should have been a very brief, very uh, straightforward final element of the journey from where they've got to, to their own land. In fact, the opening 10 chapters of the book in many ways are a continuation of what's been going on in Exodus and Leviticus. They are further laws, further requirements, particularly focused around the organization of the camp uh, as the Israelites are camped in the wilderness. One of the emphases, it seems to me, in these chapters of the book is that the people of God have to be arranged in a certain way that allows God to dwell in the midst of them. They have to be holy so that God can dwell with them. And the arrangement of the camp and some of the activities of the priests that are described in these chapters are really geared around the idea that God can't just, uh, as it were, God can't just live anywhere. God needs to be in the center of a people who are focused on him and his presence. And that sets up the first 10 chapters of the book. And if one's honest, not a lot happens in those 10 chapters. And they're probably not on people's lists of favorite chapters to read in the Old Testament. But the narrative picks up around chapter 10 as they break camp and set out, and chapter 11 as they're on their way. And the very first thing that chapter 11 says is that the people of God grumbled or complained or murmured, depends how you translate the word. It's almost as if that's a kind of character note for the people of God in this story. They are unhappy. They're unhappy because they remember what it was like when they lived in Egypt. In fact, there's a wonderful little uh, part of chapter 11 where they list the menu of things that they used to eat in Egypt. We get an impression of quite a spicy menu that they were enjoying at the time. Uh, and now here they are in the wilderness. God is providing for them. He's providing manna every day but they're not particularly content with that diet and they tend to feel that they could do better than Moses at looking after the project that they're undertaking and that they would have been better off overall if they'd stayed in Egypt in the first place. And this brings us uh, in very, very quick succession to the story that's told in Numbers 13 and 14 where they come up to look out over the land and Moses sends in 12 scouts, often called spies, 12 scouts to scout out the land. And as is perhaps well known, one of the few stories in Numbers that is well known, when they bring their reports back, uh, although Joshua and Caleb think that the prospects are good, 10 of the scouts effectively bring back a report saying, there's no way we can take this land. The people who live there are huge. We were like grasshoppers in their sight. 
and they effectively say this is a bad idea, we shouldn't do it, and there's no, no way that God is leading us in, on this pursuit. This is where I say that Numbers should have been a very short book, because in a sense that should have been it. They've arrived at the destination, they've got to where they were going, it's taken a couple of years to get them out of uh, Egypt and towards where they're going, and here they are ready to go in, God says go in, and they refuse to do it. Now, because they refuse to do it, uh, we should clarify that means that there's then 40 years in which they are left wandering in the wilderness, and that's the, the title of the book in Hebrew, and that's the, the scope of the book. It's going to tell you the story of the next 40 years. It ends up not a very short book at all. But at the key moment in chapter 14, where the people have refused to do what God has asked them to do, God says, how long will these people refuse to trust in me? And I do think that's a very significant moment in the narrative. It's a very significant choice of words where God seems to be saying that the key issue at the heart of what's gone wrong in the story told in the book is that the people don't trust him. Several chapters later, Moses is provoked by the people who are unhappy as they wander through the wilderness. Uh, and they say, there's no water. How can we survive without supplies, without water? And Moses famously takes his staff and he strikes the rock and water gushes forth. Now, the for as far as the people are concerned, that's a result. They get the water they were asking for. But in God's eyes, something has gone wrong here in Numbers chapter 20. It's actually very difficult to determine what it is. And if you look at the history of interpretation of this chapter, what has Moses done wrong? Some people say, well, he shouldn't have struck the rock. Some people say he shouldn't have spoken to the rock before he did it because it might look like he's performing magic. Some people say he did it in a proud or a self-seeking way. Um, and some people say, and I think there may be merit in this, that actually the, the precise reasons why what Moses has done is wrong uh, are not there in the text because they were slightly embarrassed to have a text which showed up Moses in such a bad light. And they, they if you like, told a very abbreviated version of the story but the one thing it does say, and the one thing that remains clear in the text, is that God says to Moses, you didn't trust me. And again, I think that's very significant, that in chapter 14, you have the people not trusting God. And in chapter 20, uh, as a result of this incident in chapter 20, Moses is told that he will not lead the people into the land. Uh, the, the key phrase, the key wording that's used is, is the failure to trust in God. And although the word doesn't occur a whole lot of other times in the book, I think it's actually a helpful framework for thinking about what's going on in the book. That in the book of Numbers, what you're effectively seeing is the people of God struggling to trust God. And the results of that lack of trust are on, on the terms of the people, in the sense of the people, that they have to wander in the wilderness. For Moses, it is the disqualification from entering into the land. Uh, one of the very few who did trust God, Joshua, who was one of the scouts who came back and said, yes, we can take the land. Uh, he does trust God, and he, he is the one who then leads the people on into the land. So I think one of the challenges that the book of Numbers raises for a reader, uh, someone who's coming to, to look at the book as it stands in Scripture today and wants to know what sort of questions is this asking of me, one of the challenges is, do you trust God? And I think Numbers portrays a period in Israel's life when there are all kinds of reasons not to trust God. And I think that's realistic. I think in the life of the person of faith, there are plenty of reasons not to trust God. And Numbers rehearses quite a few of those and shows what happens when people don't trust. So it's a very challenging book. It's a very challenging book on a personal or on a corporate level in terms of being willing to follow where God is leading. And of course that does raise interesting questions about how to discern where God is leading, which in the book are relatively straightforward. The voice of God is presented straightforwardly. Moses is the spokesperson for God. And it's clear most of the time what people should be doing. I don't think it's so straightforward for us today uh, to know exactly what God is saying. But the fundamental question of trust, I think, deep down is one that we can relate to. And I know for myself that it's, that it's often not a question of not knowing what to do. It's a question of not trusting 
that if I do what I think is the right thing, that the right consequences will follow or that I'll be able to live up to what that requires of me. So the book of Numbers, it seems to me, tells a kind of spiritual story, uh, a theological story, a story about life with God, which is quite demanding because it basically focuses on things not going well. I recently led a study day on the book of Numbers and as I was doing it, I felt we were doing a good job of reading the passages and reflecting on them. But I felt very strongly that it wasn't the kind of study day where everyone went away energized and uplifted. People went away challenged and left to ask questions about uh, the ways in which we discern God and the ways in which we do or don't trust God. 